this year. And I want to uh, welcome everybody that came today. And uh, hopefully you received uh, your uh, stewardship brochure in the mail yesterday. If not, uh, it'll be coming shortly. Uh, today we're going to have, uh, I'm going to make a few brief comments. And I will be brief. I realize the difference between a, a speech and a hostage situation. So we'll kind of proceed on. Uh, today we've got Steve Maury, uh, who is our uh, senior warden, who is going to comment on the uh, facts and figures and the uh, our vestry's goals for next year. Uh, so if you've got any kind of questions on what to expect or what we're doing or things in the operation of the church, uh, he's the guy to ask. Uh, Matthew Daniel uh, is going to be speaking on the endowment, and I'll admit that I've, I've served Two, two stints on the vestry, and, and I'm still limited on my knowledge on endowments. I'm looking forward to that, too. Uh, and we encourage any, any kind of along the way. Uh, it's, it is an open forum, and if you've got questions on anything, uh, please feel free to, to interrupt, uh, and uh, we can get those answered. Uh, and by the way, it's a great time to be at Holy Communion. I think you've probably heard that before somewhere. Uh, the, uh, uh, to start with, on stewardship, uh, we, we've all sat through these before, and, and we realize that it's basically made up of, of the three things that are uh, time, talent, and treasure. Uh, treasures. Uh, we're fortunate to be blessed with a lot of that here at Holy Communion. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to, to comment too much on, on how difficult the last uh, couple of years have been. It's, it's been tough, but it's also been a blessing. Uh, going back, we had a super successful capital campaign uh, that the professionals said we couldn't get uh, even close to accomplishing our dreams with that, and we smoked that one. Uh, we now have this beautiful and new, really, uh, this beautiful, new, and really state of the art facility, uh, and we found out that we can survive virtually. I'm so, so tired of just, I am zoomed out. Uh, and so it's, it's so, so, so much nicer to be back in uh, face to face. Uh, it's taken a big effort from all of us and also from our clergy and staff to be able to worship remotely. I think. What weren't the first couple of services on an iPhone? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the first thirty, I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> were on, on an iPhone. iPhone. <laughs> and uh, uh, it evolved into a pretty good presentation. Uh, it was sure good to come back to the nave in person and see everyone, even on a limited basis. Uh, I would like to say it'll be great when we return to normal, but I don't think anybody knows what that's what that's really going to be. But our plans are to make it even better than it was. Uh, we'll be starting this year with a ton of momentum and optimism. Uh, we've had numerous weddings uh, and baptisms during COVID. Uh, had my other notes. Uh, 13 weddings and 24 baptisms. Yeah. Pretty good. Uh, we've had a ton of visitors. So we, we, we've got the momentum going into this thing that, that uh, we're coming out of this, going into a new season uh, that's been great. Uh, we're making a tremendous investment in our hospitality, communications, and recreation ministries. Uh, we're going to roll out an entirely new and very much needed website and mobile app. Uh, I had some issues uh, negotiating along the way. Some, some, some mornings we get, I got it. Sometimes I had a picture and sometimes I had a sound, but I think that was more operator error than it was uh, anything else. Uh, but our, our existing website was not really designed for everything that is supported this year. Uh, there were some challenges by most of us and the staff. Uh, our staff and clergy have done a yeoman's job of communicating and trying to include everyone as much as they could during all of this. Uh, all of these exam are examples of our obvious and immediate needs. Uh, we're all stewards of this growing congregation and, and our new buildings, and we'll, we will need support from everyone. So please prayerfully consider your commitments for this year, and I will turn it over to Steve or to Matthew first. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Daniel, and uh, the purpose of my segment this morning is to talk about a uh, uh, to talk about about transparency into a little known but very important asset of the church, and that is its endowment. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard the term endowment. But I just wanted to kind of review uh, exactly what endowment is and what its purpose is. So today we get a page, uh, page two. Great. So in, generally speaking, an endowment is, are funds that have 
have donated to an institution that are set aside to provide a stream of income to the institution over multiple generations. So it's a very long-lived uh, asset for the institution. They provide financial support endowments to the institution uh, generally through its investment earnings. So this pool of capital is invested into the financial markets and then from the returns, we're able to distribute that to the institution over a number of years. Um, a committee, in this in the case, uh, the endowment committee, is in conjunction with the vestry, sets the, uh, the spending or the distribution rate. It's the amount of money coming out of the endowment each year that will go towards the church. Now, uh, Paige, um, the benefits of endowment are significant. Uh, it provides a steady, steady stream of income to the institution so that the church can uh, plan for and expand the mission it's set to, uh, it's set, it has for itself. And we can also we can fund new programs or expand the existing programs of the, uh, of the church. And just to give you an example, uh, it also provides greater financial stability. Because of the church's endowment, we are able to secure a loan uh, from local bank at more favorable terms than we may have been able to otherwise. Um, so that was a great benefit from the endowment. Next page, please. And just specifics about our endowment. Um, our endowment recently was about $2.4 million. The vast majority of that is intended for general use of the church. However, there's a small amount that's set aside just for the music program. As I said, the endowment invests uh, its capital into the financial markets. Um, over the last five years, we've generated on average 7.6% return on that capital. Uh, and over the last 10 years, it's been 6.9%, so we're at 7% for the last 10 years. As I mentioned, this spending policy or this distribution rate that goes from the endowment to the church on an annual basis, the current formula that we have for that is we, we take 3.5% of the average of the last three years balance. Just, just to put it in uh, a simple example, um, Let's say the average endowment for the last three years was uh, 900,000 year one, a million year two, and 1.1 million for the current year. You average those three years, in this case, simple math, it's $1 million, and then multiply that times 3.5%, which is $35,000. So under that formula, $35,000 would be transferred from the endowment to the church to use for its operating budget. In our case, uh, because our endowment is bigger than a million dollars in that example, uh, just in 2020, we provided uh, about $70,000 from the endowment to the general operating budget of the church. A small amount of that $2,000 was uh, designated just to the music program. Cumulatively, cumulatively that's a difficult word, um, over the last 10 years, the endowment has provided over $800,000 of financial support to the church in support of its mission. Um, there's been minimal additions to the endowment, about $56,000 over the last 10 years, mostly in the form of the Comparian. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, the endowment has very good governance and oversight. Um, there's an endowment committee that's made up of five members. Uh, Steve, we're on page five. Um, there's five members. It's on a staggered rolling basis, the membership there. There's also non-voting members as, um, because of their position, including Sandy as rector, Steve as senior warden, Jack as treasurer, and Teresa as a recorder of minutes. In addition, the investment advisor for the endowment is Diversified Trust Company. The committee meets quarterly, and in these quarterly meetings, we review economic conditions, the financial markets, 
review the actual performance of the endowment versus its benchmarks and decide on any actions that need to be taken. We have not really advertised this, but any member is allowed to observe these uh, endowment committee meetings or request minutes from the meetings. So just please see Teresa Boone if you're interested in that. Next page, please. This chart illustrates our endowment and how it's grown over the last decade. You can see it's been upward sloping slightly, but really assets have not grown that much. It's really because fundraising efforts in the past have focused on the capital improvement programs. And, um, and as I said, any contributions have largely come in the form of the column grant. The increase in value of the, of the endowment is largely as a result of the investment gains less the distribution policy. So the distribution policy is 3.5%. We've been returning over seven. So that differential has allowed for growth in the endowment. Next page. So the investment allocation of the endowment is, um, is as follows. About 65% of the assets are invested in the stock market, both domestic equities and international equities. And about 35% are is invested in fixed income securities and other diversifying uh, instruments. It's a pretty standard asset allocation in the industry, and uh, one that's served as well over the last uh, number of years. And then finally, next page, last page, see? Just recent developments with the endowment. Um, as a result of the capital campaign, which was over $12.5 million, there was a slight shortfall in the amount of expected contributions of about $475,000. So we launched the, the church launched the Easter to Easter challenge to extinguish this $475,000 shortfall. And recently we've raised $241,000 uh, that's gone towards that. And we hope that by next Easter we'll have uh, extinguished the entire uh, shortfall. So, um, good question. It goes to my next point that, um, and the question was about contributions from the endowment to uh, cover the shortfall. And the Best Reading Endowment Committee made the decision recently to help fund that shortfall. And so, in addition to the 3.5% spending policy, the endowment is going to provide an extra 2% over each year for two years. Uh, to help fund that shortfall. That will equate to about $85,000 from the endowment to help fund the shortfall. And again, this has no effect on the 3.5% standard spending rate that goes towards the operating budget of the church. Any questions? That concludes my remarks. Any questions on that? Yes? Um, the $2 million endowment, um, it seems, that seems like That's a good question, and it's really, it's a, uh, um, the, and I think that uh, Steve can maybe talk a little bit about, about this in his remarks, but if we don't provide that $68,000 to the church for its budget, then it means that the, the budget, that shortfall has to be made up someplace else through annual giving, or we need to cut back on, uh, on um, things that the church wants to do. So we're trying to find the right balance on spending versus uh, versus not. And I will tell you that the spending rate has been reduced uh, in the last few years. It used to be 5.5% per year, and now it's been dropped to 3.5% with the exception of this one-time uh, contribution to fund the shortfall. So we're trying to, look, we're trying to find the right balance uh, to do that. But I hear you, and a bigger endowment would be better, obviously. It, uh, allows us to do so many uh, great things in support of the mission, um, but we're just trying to find the right balance. Steve, do you have any comments on that? Oh, I'll touch on that. Okay. Increasing endowment, can, can we make designated gifts to the endowment or you know, wills that leave it or do you want to do stock transfers or that type of thing? Is that, you, you can direct those funds wherever you want to support it. Yes, I, I, I don't know the particulars, but I know there's mechanisms. 
mechanisms for current contributions to the endowment as well as uh, ways to leave it in your will, uh, contributions to the endowment. And I think Teresa in the office could, could address those specifics. Do we have any, like, a, it's like a, when, when she was at DTS, you had the endowment for the seminary, and then there were separate gifts that had been made to funds that weren't controlled by the um, seminary that then provided annual income to the, uh, to the seminary. Does Holy Communion have, like, say, consistent gifts where somebody maybe gave to the community foundation instead, or it's like, or is it sort of wrapped up all in the endowment? I believe it's all wrapped up, wrapped up in the endowment. Steve, do you have any conversations? So just to give you an example of the way endowment works on a much larger scale, um, St. Jude here in Memphis, uh, they have an endowment in excess of $5 billion. And that's a lot of money. But what that does, in addition to their ongoing annual support that they get from their donors, it allows St. Jude to invest in uh, expanding their facilities, to hire uh, world-class researchers and scientists and physicians, uh, and increase the number of hospital beds. So uh, they're able to do that because of the massive support from their endowment. So obviously a, 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 a long-term objective would be to increase the size of the endowment, but um, because of the significant financial impact it has on the, on the church for not just our lifetime, but for the next generation and the generation after. significant. 
And the cash varies. Again, this is a snapshot. If you did it the next day, the balance would be different. Uh, there's some other minor things, prepaid items, that sort of thing, things that we have paid in advance for, um, expenses we have paid in advance. Uh, those are assets. Those change on a regular basis as well. Um, next one. Uh, the, the bottom section are the liabilities and, and the fund balances. Uh, the liabilities are what we owe. Um, we've got operating obligations. Uh, prepaids, that sort of thing. Again, those change day by day. Um, if we run accounts with different vendors, those would show on the balance sheet as, as short-term debts. Uh, the important part to us are the loans. You'll see two loans on here, the construction loan and the gap loan. Uh, the construction loan right now is about 301000 uh, To give you a little background, the gap loan, by the way, is what we're calling addressing with the, the Easter to Easter challenge is about 268. So we're about 570,000 as of the end of August in debt. What we did as a vestry, we, we took a look, and I say we, I really mean Jack. Um, he, they took a look, he and Teresa took a look at what was owed on the loan and took a look at the pledges that were committed out into the future. They took the pledges and, and discounted them for lack of a better word, just for pledges they thought we might not collect. You never know who, but there's going to be some out there. So you discounted a little bit for that. Uh, they identified that amount and left that, that part of the loan alone. The part of the construction loan that we didn't have identified pledges to pay, we called the gap. And we made the decision with interest rates as low as they were, with the endowment available, and approached our bank and essentially turned that part of the debt out. So we fixed the interest rate on that part, essentially carved this construction loan into two loans, and we fixed the interest rate on that portion that we call the gap loan. Um, it's a very low rate. It's down in the 2% range. It is secured by the endowment. Uh, we put some flexibility in the payment of it. Generally speaking, we wanted it on a 10-year payback but we put some flexibility in the terms to account for this next year of the Easter Easter Challenge. We didn't know where the balance would be at the end of the year. So we get to reset things at the end of this period. Ideally, the Easter to Easter Challenge is totally successful and we retire that whole thing. At that point, the construction loan, remaining construction loan, gets paid back organically through the pledges. That will happen, you know, everybody put their pledges on different schedules, but that will happen over some next couple of years, I would guess, as pledges are collected. So ideally, we get to the tail end of this, the Easter to Easter challenge is successful. We collect all the pledges, and we become debt-free. Um, that would be a big place to be. That, that would really be significant. And as we get into the income statement, you'll see why. Um, I think that you can go to the next one. The income statement, a couple of things about that. Number one, it is not a snapshot. The income statement will always cover a period of time, whether it be a quarter, whether it be six months, whether it be year to date, or we typically look at them annually. Uh, that is the, the document, that is the tool we use to budget. So at the beginning of the year, when we set the budget for the year for the church, we do it through the income statement. We will know what these, uh, result of the stewardship campaign is we will know what our pledged revenues are. We will estimate unpledged revenues, we'll estimate other income, and then we basically spend it. We go back to last year's budget, we look at salaries for the staff, for the clergy, we look at, uh, we look at all the expenses we expect to have, um, and we set the budget for the year. Um, we use the budget through the year. We use the income statement through the year to track it. And you can see that on, on the handout I gave you of actual versus budget and year to date. And you get a good idea of how you're tracking. You know, if we get halfway through the year and our revenue is way off of expectations, then we have to start making some decisions about expenses. But that's another use for the income statement is to track actual results. And we can also use it to track trends, and, and you'll see that in a minute as well. 
Hey, Steve, quick question on the uh, tiny back to the endowment, the annual uh, uh, distribution or spending that comes from the endowment to the church. Where is that listed on here? Next page. Okay. <laughs> so this is the revenue section of the income statement. This is the top line. Um, and you can see the various sources, pledges, um, undesignated gifts. That's We have people that give regularly to the church but do not pledge, um, which is which is fine. I mean, we're happy to have the, the gifts. I mean, it would be nice if we knew, if they knew they were going to give, they, could, they were going to pledge, and we could plan more for it. But I'm not complaining. Plate collections is just what it sounds like. Facility use, we derive income from various sources for, from our facilities. Um, we have music teachers. We have groups that come in and rent space, um, and we derive income from that. That is something that, moving forward, we had plans to do that even more with the new facilities in place. And then pandemic hit, and that kind of stopped that for a while. But that's still on our, on our plate as a vestry to increase that income. Uh, you've got other income, which is just what it sounds like, miscellaneous. And then the last line is transfers from other funds. And this is where it comes into the, to the income statement, the, the endowment. Um, that could be from other funds, but almost all of it is from the endowment. Um, next one, next page. Um, after <coughs> revenues, you look at, you look at expenses. Uh, you've got the diocesan and social ministries. Uh, we, we have an obligation, uh, committed to make a, a fairly large contribu contribution to the di diocese each year. And that's based on the previous year's financials. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a formula that they use, and we pretty much are committed to that. And it's a pretty big number. Uh, we have various outreach programs that we do. Um, beyond those expenses, you get into what I call the operating expenses of the church. <clears throat> it's probably not the best term for it, but it would include paying the clergy. Uh, it would include maintenance. It would include funding the music program, funding Christian education, recreation, youth parish life. Parish life. Uh, the important piece of this to think about with Emily's comment is if we want to draw less from the endowment, which is a fantastic goal, uh, we got to find the money somewhere. And you'll see as we look at the, the income statement over the years, um, there's not a whole lot of excess in our budget. So we would have to either alt alter income or alter outcome. And that's, that's the crux of my message today. Um, next page. Uh, this is the bottom line of the, of the income statement. We've got total revenues less total expenses. Um, as of the end of August, expenses exceeded revenue by $23,000. That's, that's not that unusual this time of year. And that's what Jack would tell you. Revenue does not come in smoothly. We get a big kick at the end of the year. We typically go into November and December underwater on the budget. And then a lot of people make year end gifts that, that, that balance it out. Um, for the year, year to date, expenses have exceeded revenue by 18,000. So we're in the hole about 18,000 right now, um, year to date. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's the primer of financial savings. Uh, if you would look at the extremely busy spreadsheet on the back, this is the legal size page. Um, I had fun doing this. This was actually kind of interesting to do. And, and I don't know if you've had time to, to look through it, but uh, <coughs> I went back and got this income statement, or this, this income statement that we use that I handed out is the form that we use in the vestry meetings. It's the form that you receive at the annual meeting. Um, so we, we have those historically. I was able to get with Teresa and go back in time, and I plotted our income statement on this spreadsheet back 15 years, 16 years. Um, it's really handy when you get income statements as a banker. I love getting them when they're structured the same every year because it becomes really easy to compare year to year and see trends. Um, I, I find this fascinating to look um, say at the top line, and I intentionally left the column and row heading on this. So if y'all have questions, it becomes easy to reference what we're talking about. So 
Right now, I'm at the top line, E3. So this is total pledges for 2005. And you can track across that row and see how pledges have changed through the years. And you can do that with any, any of the revenue lines. Um, I think it's interesting to, on, on row eight, transfers from other funds. Uh, Matthew said we're, we're drawing 3.5% from the endowment each year. And you can see if you look at um, column T, 75,000 is what we drew in 2020, which is, makes sense. But if you look backwards in time, you can see we have drawn much more than that in the past. It would be nice not to draw any to fund operating expenses. But we've done it for years, and it's been part of our budget for years. Um, one thing that I find fascinating to look at um, one more. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this graph. Uh, it's probably too small. Um, and this is not on our income statement that you see, but I pulled it out on rows uh, 10 and 11. I took our total revenue and took out the parts that aren't given by the membership of the church. Uh, I'm taking out facility use, and I'm taking out other income and the transfers. So all I'm looking at are pledges, undesignated gifts, and plate collections. That's money that actually comes out of y'all's pockets uh, on, a, on a regular basis. That is uh, row 10. I was able to get copies of our parochial report that we submit each year and got daily or average Sunday attendance. And I've got that listed down on row 38. And I compared the two, and it's really interesting to look, if you can see on the graph, our revenues are the, are the orange line, have been steadily even or going up, and our average Sunday attendance has been steadily dropping. So if we're losing attendees at the same time, our giving is going up substantially. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, fewer people, but more committed. And one thing I have to point out, and if I don't point it out two more times, hit me over the head, these revenue numbers do not include capital giving. Does not include the capital campaign. It's a lot of money. So if you add that, I didn't have access to the numbers and when Sandy and I tried to dig them up quickly and we couldn't, so I promised him I would mention that. But that makes that yellow line go way up. It's a lot of money. Uh, I think that's fascinating statistic. statistic. Um, of how giving is going up with attendance going down. Um, you can see how expenses have changed through the years. Um, the diocesan commitment is fairly consistent. And again, that's tracking our top line numbers. So you would expect that to be fairly consistent. Um, outreach has changed significantly. I'm on row 16, if you take a look at that. Um, Hester actually had something to do with that. Yes? So it comes out of operating fund now. Yeah, so I asked Sandy about that. And if, if you notice, I didn't mention this housekeeping. On, on row one, with the dates, you'll see numbers that correspond to the notes down at the bottom. Uh, number eight is, where are we? Column O is essentially when Hester came out of becoming being a curate and became responsible for our outreach. And she made some changes to how that was done. And if you see the drop there, I thought that was interesting and I wondered what was going on. And Sandy said, I, I, I hope I get it right if you want to say it. But we went from just giving money to groups to doing it more on a grant basis. So yeah, we had we had grants even before that too. But what we were doing was giving a whole lot of money, uh, but but not a lot of in-person engagement with that. So we tried to balance those up a little bit and look at those historic partners and say if we're going to give, we're also going to be involved in building relationship. We also moved it from coming completely out of endowment to coming out of our operating budget because before we were only giving from our gravy. We weren't giving sacrificially from our own operating budget. So we switched how the money was getting channel, channeled into it. But the other comment Sandy made is we were giving money to organizations. 
and we made a change, and some of those organizations got dropped. And he said, with one exception, we didn't hear from any of them. None of them spoke up and said, hey, we miss you. We miss your contribution. And the one that said something, we put, put them back. back in. Yes, yes. So it, we're giving less, and I'd love to give more, but at least we're giving it more attention right now. Uh, that, that was an interesting comment from Sandy. Uh, one other comment I want to make, and I want to get to the bottom line of this, but if you look at, at row 22, cl clergy expenses, um, <laughs> this, first of all, this includes not just salary, it includes all employment expenses. Uh, you need to bear in mind as you look across that row, you're going to have varying numbers of clergy. There's a point at which in there we didn't have any clergy. So you, you can't look at trends without knowing what's going on, and that's partly where the notes come in and help, um, to put some, some background to it. Um, Sandy wanted to point out that the, um, let me get my numbers here, I'll make sure I don't, I don't to with me. Um, Sandy likes to look at things compared to inflation rates, to the consumer price index. Uh, if you start with 2005 and go out to, to column U, to, tw or to 2020, column T, the consumer price index would say that clergy salaries have not kept up with inflation. Uh, essentially, with some exceptions, um, the, the clergy and the staff basically have gotten cost of living increases. Every time we do the budget, we look at inflation for the year and basically cost of living, and that's it. But then, with only a couple of exceptions, no real increases. Uh, a lot of what you see in that number is healthcare costs and other employment costs and not salary. Uh, I say that to point out that, you know, the vestry tries to be good stewards with the giving to the church, uh, but we also need to be fair to the employees and to the, to the clergy. So that, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you can see through the other areas if there's any that you have particular interest in. Uh, you know, we've been heavily involved in recreation on line 28. You, you know, that's all of that has had fairly steady growth, probably not keeping up with inflation, but steady growth. Uh, one thing I felt was thought was interesting is how smooth the maintenance number was on, on row 23. Um, it's been fairly consistent. I'm hoping that comes down now that we are in essentially new facilities. You know, we will see over time whether that happens. Uh, so the important, important row to look at is row 33, revenue less expenses. This would be net profit if we were a business. Uh, it's, it's all over the board, but if you look at, and, and we need to pull 2020, 2020 out, um, that shows essentially revenues less expenses of 156,000. Uh, that is a COVID year. Uh, we had a lot of things going on. Number one, we had really dialed back operations. Sandy, Sandy wanted me to use the phrase to remember how scared we were at the beginning of this. Uh, everybody dialed back. What didn't dial back, which was really impressive, was the giving to the church. And so for that one year, we end up with a pretty good surplus. But if you ignore 2020 and look back, you can see we don't have a whole lot of excess in our budget. One thing you will notice that's not in here as an expense is interest expense or debt service. You know, we've got these loans hanging out there, but we don't have money in the budget to cover them, which is why we took the, the gap and pulled it out and, and fixed the rate and put it on a low term, which is why we went to the endowment and said, we need extra from the endowment to pay this. It was a discussion of whether we should just take the money out of the endowment and pay the debt off, as opposed to putting a loan in place and servicing it. And we came to the agreement after discussion that we would let the endowment make the payments and we would endeavor through Easter to Easter to try and retire. But there is not room in our operating budget for debt service. That number was a lot bigger when we started talking about service. It, it was, it was. Fortunately, we're to the point where if we get to the end of the, if we got collected no more money for Easter to Easter, 
there is enough in that 2% to service the debt and retire it much quicker than 10 years. But we would still be making monthly payments. Uh, ideally, we get that retired through contributions in Easter to Easter. That's really what our goal is. And you'll be hearing more about that as we get into next year. Um, what also is not in this budget is anything Dale talked about. We're coming out of COVID. We're coming back to church. We've got a brand new facility. The vestry has great plans for what we'd like to do. We'd like to do new programs. We'd like to be speakers. We'd like to do a lot of new things. we got to pay for them. And I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's a fixed rate. It's fixed for the term of the loan. I'm almost certain that's true. Um, so, no, the question then becomes, do you borrow money against the endowment to essentially not pull it out of the endowment? Does it make sense to kind of arbitrage that? Does it make sense to borrow at 2% so Matthew can go get a bigger return? That's essentially what we're doing. Uh, I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't do that. I would much rather retire to that. Uh, talking to a bank yes, you're talking to a banker saying pay the loan off, which is kind of an oxymoron. But, um, that's that's my opinion. I, I I do think Matthew and the committee are doing a great job managing that money, and so far it's working. You know, they're they're out earning the interest expense. Uh, but the key to this whole thing in showing. The revenue less expenses is we don't have a whole lot of cushion in our budget to do other things, uh, to look at compensation, to look at new programs. Uh, and that, in essence, is the purpose of this spreadsheet and to show that it is not really a short term recent phenomenon. It's, it's been the case through the years that we don't have a lot of cushion in the budget. And ideally, if we can. If everybody can buy into the stewardship campaign, if we can raise our revenues, keep our expenses in line, and raise our revenues, we'll have some money to do things like that. It would be ideal. My greatest goal would be to not withdraw anything from the endowment to support the operating budget. I mean, how cool would that be to fund ourselves and fund all of our operations with new programs, not take any draw from the endowment, and then once a year as a group sit down and think, what can we do with this money that was otherwise going to the operating budget? What project can we take on? What, can we, what problem out in the city can we address? And once a year as a group, make a decision and, and, and actually help somebody with that endowment. That would be pretty cool. Um, how neat would that be for a parish-wide meeting? Anyway, that's, that's basically what I have to say. I, I, I was gonna say it at the beginning and I'll say it now. Uh, my parents came to this church in the mid-50s, something like that, long before I was here. Uh, I've been at this church my whole life. I was raised in this church, and now I'm raising my daughters in this church. Uh, one of the, the keys, one of the, the strategic initiatives in our plan, our strategic plan, is sustainability. Uh, my main goal is, is being on the vestry and a senior warden is to build in stability into our finances so that we can make sure this church is here and vibrant and strong and doing great things when my daughter's kids need to find a church. I mean, it's been here a long time and I wanna make sure it stays. And that, that in a nutshell is what I wanna get out of serving on the vestry. And I'd encourage y'all to take this, excuse me, take this home and spend some time looking through it. It's kind of fun to do, to look at things year by year. I'm kind of a spreadsheet nerd, but it's, it's interesting to see how things change. It's interesting to look through it with the notes at the bottom and see what's happening in the church and how does it reflect in the budget. So I stand for any questions.
into that three year trailing average. So it will it will impact what comes out in the next three years. Well, it, it works in reverse. You know, the market goes up, and that's why it's been growing in the last few years because the market has been running, um, and that falls into that trailing three-year average. And so, you know, the contribution will be going up as well. I mean, I take that back. The contribution will be going up, but if their earnings exceed that, that's where it grows. Likewise, it will shrink if the contribution doesn't. Yeah, I think that the the, uh, the intent of that three-year rolling is to kind of smooth out the contribution so that short-term fluctuations in the market don't do crazy things with our budget. So it kind of smooths things out, and we can adjust over time as the market goes up, up or down. If you look at the Fed, the OAO nine hundred for the uh, revenues that came from down is still substantial, mm -hmm. and it needs to be because that's that's. Those are the times we need the most help in the budget. Is when the, the economy is really tough and stewardship may drop off. And, and it probably should. You know, it's it's people should give according to their abilities. And if the economy's bad, you know, that's when we need the help. But I would I, the whole purpose of this, I've wanted to do this for three years, and it's to me, again, I'm a spreadsheet nerd, but um, point of this is to think about this and think about that bottom line on Stewardship Sunday. We wanted to get this out and talk to people before that, before this shows up in your mail and you pull the card out and fill it out. Hey Steve, uh, I have a question uh, as it relates to the PPP loan. I, I didn't really see it on the balance sheet here. Did we receive one and what happened with that? We did receive one. Um, the reason it's not on the balance sheet is it came and went in the same year, and it didn't go, so to speak. Um, we did get a PPP loan of roughly $230,000. Um, if, if you know what that's for, that is to ensure companies and, and organizations maintain their employment levels. If you didn't maintain the employment levels, the PPP loan would not be forgiven. You'd have to pay it back. Uh, we did maintain our employment levels at the church. In fact, we kept everyone on staff, even those that, I mean, the buildings weren't open. I mean, even those that would maintain the buildings still got paid. But we, we did it right. We applied that to the employment expense as we were supposed to. We documented, Teresa documented that well, and the loan was forgiven. The reason it's not on the balance sheet is it wasn't there at the beginning of the year, and it was gone. So it went into income. It went into income. It went into cash. Yes. Yes. So that's yes. So it's not in the net income of, of that year because it's not really income, but it is in the cash. Uh, we were really fortunate to be able to do that. Um, I think when when COVID hit and when everything shut down, I don't think anybody knew what was going to happen. And I, I did an abrupt about face. Um, on one day, I came to Sandy and to the executive committee in the vestry and said, I think we ought to take money out of the endowment and pay this loan off. We've got the money, let's have the certainty. Three days later, I came back in and said, I'm changing my mind. And I'm not kidding. Um, things were so uncertain in a fairly short period of time with what was going to happen with employment, um, unemployment. Uh, nobody knew what was going to happen. And we didn't know what to expect as a church. As it turns out, it's, it's amazing how the giving not only maintained, but it increased, which is really impressive. Um, it was a big relief, but we didn't know for a while there. And I literally flipped my position in three days. And Sandy still pokes me about that. About that. <laughs> uh, the last thing I would say, um, last slide, and this is from Sandy. He is so grateful. We have had three great treasures. Um, Jack is doing a fantastic job. David did as well. John Lewis did. Sandy said, I have had three great treasures, and I would appreciate it if you would thank them. So there you go. I'm sorry they're not here. Actually, I'm not, because they would be pointing out everything I did wrong. Uh, but I, I wish they were, because Sandy's really grateful. I'm sure Dave's got a graph somewhere for you. He probably does. Jim? Just an observation. Yeah, 
That's the graph I showed you. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, the expenses are going to be just as flat as the revenue right. because we don't deficit spend. I mean, we figure out what the revenue is and set the expenses to match. So that is going to be just as flat. But you're right. And to me, the biggest thing ahead of us as a church, if we want to grow, is to grow. We've got to get new members. And what I would suggest from a stewardship point of view is we need to prime the pump. We really need to step up over the next two or three or four years and give the vestry enough resources to start doing some new programs and trying new things so that we can bring new members in. I don't think they're going to come just because they want to and then we get the money and we get their additional giving and then we can do neat things. I don't think that's going to work. We've got to get it growing. We need new young families in. Um, I, I'd like to look at it, and I haven't seen it. You could probably dig it up and put the math to it, but how the giving is spread over age groups. Uh, my fear, and I may be wrong, but my fear of that graph is that we're relying more and more on older and older givers, and it's really incumbent on the younger people to start stepping up. And nobody expects a young family to give um, a ton of money. But the idea is, year by year by year, as you become more and more stable, you step up the game. And that's personally what we've done year by year. But that's what needs to happen, and we need new families. We need new people in. We need to stop that trend of downward attendance. And bring our old people back. Okay. You know, they don't have to come in person. If, if we can continue the streaming services, I mean, we need to rethink who's a member of the church. It's not just people who are sitting in the pews. I mean, we've got people connected. We need to stay in touch with them. And that's part of what's happening with the new website, that sort of thing. And we're really working hard to increase communication and make it a lot easier to get on the website and get to a service. Or to, on Monday or Tuesday, y'all tell your friends what a great presentation Steve put on. And by the way, it's on the website. Click on it. You really should hear it. I would love to have had this. They're, they're on with us now. I would love to have been able to post this where they could page through it with us. Um, I'm probably a little bit slow on this, so I didn't have time for that. But that would be neat. There's no reason we couldn't have uh, remote presence in the forum and have them be able to call in questions or text in questions and, and engage with them live. Those that are out of town traveling, too sick to come. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I hadn't, hadn't got back yet. Um, and remind me, I know, I know she's deceased. And, and what was, what was the question again? And will you welcome me this way? Because I have to go get past it.